So our plan tonight is uh, we're going to have a presentation and then some time for questions and answers. And tonight we're excited to have Karen Gimnick. She is the assistant director here at Coho US with me, um, focusing on all things communications related and website and a little bit of everything. She's a professional facilitator working through or with Amago relationships. And tonight she's going to be talking about personal growth, which she firmly believes is the most important reason for co-housing. So, Karen, welcome. Thank you. I'm gonna put a screen share up here. Um, yeah, I don't know if I firmly believe it's the most important reason for, <laughs> for co-housing, but, but I think it is worth, it's in the mix, it's in the running, and that's what I wanna talk about tonight. Um, it's not, I think, the thing we talk about most, and um, I think, there's some aversion to it in the community. So I will say I particularly appreciate those of you who showed up to do this with me tonight. Um, I think it's really lovely that you're here and um, thank you for that. Let me dive right in. Um, I'm gonna talk for about 15 minutes and we're gonna have lots of time for questions and discussion because I'm real interested in what you all think about this as well. Um, Co-housing is sometimes called the longest personal growth workshop ever. And tonight I'm gonna to make the case that we need the personal growth that co-housing enables and demands. I'm not suggesting that communities should do more touchy-feely stuff or try to force growth. I'm suggesting the opposite, that living in, co in community in co-housing reliably challenges us to grow, whether we want to or not, and that that is a good thing. My hope is that naming it as such will help us to have the courage to include the value of our growth in our marketing messages and conversations about co-housing. I want to put this in a bit of context. Life in the 21st century is hard for a lot of reasons. We are more isolated and sicker than we've probably ever been. Our planet is sicker. Politics are, well, as politics are these days. And there's a really strong need for change. And with that need for change is a pretty significant sense of powerlessness among a lot of people. In this moment, perhaps more than ever, the world needs people who are able to bring us together. We need citizens who make collaboration happen in spite of pressures to compete, who see beyond what we have been raised to believe is inevitable, and show us what is possible. We need people who live in the expectation of connection and joy to build that new reality. There have been leaders in every generation with these qualities, but never as many as we need now. Our planet is in crisis, and we need ways to grow the people who can lead us to solutions. The reason I have built a career in co-housing is that co-housing grows collaborative leaders and citizens better than anything else I know. Our world needs us. So why do I think that co-housing produces these people? Because I see it. One of my favorite people in co-housing, well, wait, I have a lot of favorite people in co-housing, which sort of helps make my point. But one of them in particular said to me, Co-housing has caused more personal transformation than anything I have done since the Peace Corps. Now, I want to be clear. Phil didn't move into co-housing because he was looking for or expecting personal growth. My sense is that he'd done quite a bit of growing before he moved in, and I'm guessing he was pretty well adjusted before co-housing. Still, he says that living in co-housing, he grew a lot more. Turns out, that even those of us who have it together enough to know we want co-housing are still in the baby steps of what it takes to really live collaborative life. Collaborative culture is different than what we grew up with. It takes a lot of learning over years to rewrite our internal programs and fully live the collaborative culture we all strive for. We all have more to learn and more growing to do. Even if most of us, maybe all of us, don't have any idea how far we have yet to go. 
And that's okay. Because even when we don't have any idea where our rough edges are, co-housing shows them to us. One of the reasons we aren't better at collaboration is that we haven't done much of it living in our separate homes. We haven't had as much opportunity to rub up against people whose needs compete with ours. We haven't tried to share so much with others who believe different things and value different things and want different things and have different ways of going about getting the things they want. Until we move into co-housing, we haven't had others reflect back to us so much. The ways in which our ways aren't the only ways or even the best ways. And our truths are not the only truths. And our righteous indignation isn't actually all that righteous. The truth is, we don't usually like it all that much when they do. In co-housing, it's bound to happen that our neighbors point out to us the ways in which we are less than our best possible selves, which enables growth. Sometimes in small, subtle ways, sometimes in dramatic conflict, one way or another, when humans spend enough time caring about each other, these things come out. One way they come out is through the care and compassion we show our neighbors. It's a good thing, but it's not always easy. It requires us to see their needs and try to meet them. And in the kind of beauty that only nature could design, meeting their needs often pushes against our own needs and beliefs. When that happens, their needs and our care for them pushes us to grow a part of ourselves that really needed growing. It takes us in a new way to a new way of being that is more rich, more joyful, and more aligned with our values than what we had before. This is a gift. It is a gift we give to others as we care for them, and that comes back to us, especially when the giving was particularly challenging. And then it is a gift to the world because we take this new better bit of us everywhere we go. The great value of community is that for most of us, this is unavoidable. We don't have to go looking for the opportunity. Community will provide it. The better news is that with a little work, we can learn to make it happen more efficiently and less painfully. I'm not going to tell you that growth is fun. Even for a personal growth junkie like me, growth means letting go of things that are comfortable and comforting. And it usually takes some pain to make us do that. What I will tell you is that growth doesn't have to be excruciating. When we lean into it, welcome it, expect it, we can do it more gently. When we live in community and we learn together the strategies that make it easier, we can grow with support from one another. So how do we do that? Well, there's more to it than I can cover in a single web chat, but the good news is that we already have some web chats with important pieces. Tonight, I'm going to give you five tools, which will include references to a couple of other web chats that you can find through cohousing.org at the link I suspect Karin has already put in the chat. Tool number one, embrace conflict as opportunity for growth. Or as we say in the Imago community, conflict is growth trying to happen. This piece is so important that I did a whole web chat on it. It's web chat number 30 if you want to go looking for it. The basic idea is that when we approach conflict as an opportunity and work our way through it, we get growth. When we resist conflict and try to make it go away, a very common approach in co-housing, in my experience, it tends to come back to haunt us. Tool number two, be intentional. Tell yourself that you have more growing to do and set an intention for doing it. It doesn't have to be immediate or huge or overwhelming. Just decide to engage in your community with the expectation that whatever might be going on, Part of what you are there for is to become a better you. That intention will carry you far. Three, get really curious. There are a lot of things to be curious about. In community, be curious about your neighbors. Who are they? What are they passionate about? What matters to them? 
when they disagree with you, get curious about the great reasons they think what they think. And more importantly, get curious about yourself. Who are you? What are you passionate about? What matters to you? What are the reasons you think what you think? And when something doesn't feel right or is irritating to you, get curious about that. What does that thing mean to you? Why is it triggering you when it probably doesn't trigger some others? What part of your life experience is telling you that this situation is not okay? Does that same lesson really apply here? Curiosity is the antidote to judgment. Practice it until it becomes a solid skill in your toolbox. Four, practice empathy. Tune into the emotional side of community life, both in day-to-day -day life and in conflict. Pay attention to joy and sorrow, your own as well as others. Our behavior is driven more by our emotions than by our thoughts, more by affective selves than our cognitive selves. Notice and name feelings whenever you can. Check in with others. Make space for emotions. And lastly, tool number five is an actual tangible practice that grows and supports the previous four. Train your brain to be an excellent listener. Listen often and be listened to. The structure I use for this is called mirroring. And I introduced it in my very first web chat, which is web chat number two, if you're looking. Mirroring is an act of making space for someone else's story. Rather than respond with your own ideas, you respond by mirroring back what they have said. It goes something like this. Perhaps Karen tells me about her morning and I repeat back, word for word if I can, what she said to me. So I might say, what I heard you say is that you got up, had breakfast with Liv, and then walked to your office to start work. And then I check. Did I get you? I want to know if I understood what she was wanting to say, which has very little to do with whether I got the words right, though that helps, and everything to do with whether the thing that is real for her lodged in my brain. And then, and this may be the very most powerful bit of mirroring, I hold space for her. I invite deeper sharing. I say, is there more? And odds are, in the safety of being heard and with the invitation, this is where I will learn the meat of Karin's morning. Maybe her dog is sick and she's worried, or she saw the most beautiful sunrise and it touched her. Odds are, this is where I get to see into her heart. And there, in the shared space of heart, growth happens, sometimes small, sometimes profound. In the safety of that shared space, we can tolerate seeing our rough edges. We can stand to do the work of growing. I could end there. But I promise to tell you something about what to do when it is someone else's growing you would like to make happen. You know the old adage, the only one you can change is yourself. And I'm not sure that's true, or at least it isn't as simple as that. You see, relational stuff is all contagious. Anxiety, joy, fear, excitement, sense of danger and safety, all contribute to relationships and all contribute to our behavior. And they all ripple out from person to person through pheromones and vagal nerves and I suspect a bunch of stuff that science hasn't named yet. We are never really isolated or autonomous, especially not in community. So I think it's true. You probably can't make someone else change their behavior in the way you'd like. You might be able to use rules or fines or social pressure to force them to do something they wouldn't do otherwise, but I would advise against it. What you can do is influence them. Actually, your ripples already do influence them. The trick is to influence them in ways that align with collaborative culture. There are things you can do. You can make space for them, hear them, mirror them. 
you can create as much safety as possible because safety is the most essential piece to helping anyone change. No one wants to be disconnected, excluded, or judged. They do what they do, even when others don't like it, because it's the best they can. And the more they feel disconnected, excluded, or judged, the more they feel it. It doesn't matter whether you intended it. The more they feel judged and unsafe, the less likely they are to do the vulnerable work of growing. So what can you do about others in your community that in your opinion have some growing to do? You can accept them, invite them, make space for them in whatever ways you can tolerate. I'm not suggesting self-sacrifice and resentment. I'm not saying you should pretend to agree with them. I'm saying that the most effective way to support growth in another is to create safe spaces. And the most powerful way to do that is to do your own growth. The more I learn my triggers and my stressors, the more that I'm able to make my impact match my intention, the more that I can name clearly my needs and emotions, the safer I am for other humans. Which brings me back to where I began. The most important work we have to do in the world may be our own personal growth. And while we call it personal, it is actually something we are designed to do in community. We need each other to help us find our growth edges, to hold us in safety as we walk those vulnerable paths, to show up with needs that motivate us in ways that our own needs do not. Community is an ideal place for the growth that makes us more collaborative, more conscious, more connected, and more effective in our world. Personal growth is essential to build the skills we need, that our communities need, that our leaders need, that our world needs, which is why I believe personal growth may be the most important reason for co-housing. And that is what I have prepared. And now I'm happy to open it up to questions. I'm hoping we'll get discussion and thoughts and I'm eager to hear what others have to say. As I mentioned earlier, you um, can unmute yourself to be able to offer comments or ask questions. Karen, I have a question. Uh, Diane, Diane McCarty of Trillium Hollow. Um, embracing conflict um, is, was at the top of your list. I agree. Um, but in the culture you live in, I, what tips do you have to get there? And, and part of the reason I'm asking is because I moved into co-housing two years ago when, when I retired. And I've always believed that it's good to address issues that come up. Um, but here people often say we're a conflict avoidance um you know culture although they they know it's not good so what what tips you know if any do you have about how we move from kind of culturally being trained to avoid conflict to embracing it in a way that's productive great question um yeah so I think conflict avoidance is, I mean, it's common in the population of the US. It's more common, in my opinion, in co-housing. Um, and I'm, we could have another conversation about why that is, but, but it is the pattern that I see. Um, so I think, I think you're asking a really important question of how do we get from conflict avoidance to um, being able to engage with conflict in ways that are productive. And that's a, I mean, I could do a full weekend of workshop on it, so I haven't given you the really tip of the iceberg here, but I think one of the key things to understand is that conflict avoidance is a defensive strategy, right? It, it's a yearning for safety. It's a learned behavior of um, how, what we learned somewhere in our life is the way to stay safe, and it probably served us at that time in our life. So learning to shift that pattern is pretty scary. 
and, and appropriately so. I mean, that's just the, the normal human response to changing and giving up something that had kept us safe at some other important point in our life. And so I think what it comes down to is you have to figure out how to create safety. And you don't get absolute safety. There's no such thing in human relationships, but you can make more safety and putting structures in place helps with that. So I do a lot when I work with groups to use the mirroring structure and there's an expanded version that, that's called the Imago Dialogue. Um, I do a lot with that. I use consensus or sociocratic structures. I encourage groups to, to when they have meetings, to be very structured about those meetings. Um, and essentially, the more safety you need, the more structure I recommend. Um, so that, that's the beginning piece, but it's also about practicing communication skills. There's an incredible amount of safety in being seen and really heard by another. Um, and I do workshops with various groups, co-housing and others. And what I find pretty reliably is that when I first give people the opportunity to do the mirroring structure, they are stunned at how different it feels to be heard in that way um, and often really touched. And I think that that speaks to how much we have a yearning to be really, really seen, really, really held by another. And I think there's safety that comes in that. So I think there are a number of sort of ways to go about it. And it really starts with understanding that those people who are conflict avoidant aren't doing it because they're selfish or mean or bad or any of those other sort of judgy things we like to put on it. They're doing it because it's how they stay safe. Um, and we're going to have to give them a way to be safe in conflict or they're not going to engage or to be safer in conflict. Um, so that's an overview. And there's, of course, tons more depth. Other questions? That was a good one. Hi, uh, Karen. Um, I'm aware that we did our Myers-Briggs type indicator here in our co-housing community here in North Carolina, and uh, we found that about uh, at least 60 to 70 percent of the people in co-housing were introverts. So they were not people who were comfortable with eye contact necessarily. They were not people who wanted to sit on the front porch. They prefer the back porch, and they needed their space so something about me as a fairly strong extrovert has reacted to that and i wondered if you have any thoughts about how it's almost like waiting for the turtle to pull it out of the shell because it's pulled in <laughs> uh that's what i used to you know there's actually a song about you can't make a turtle come out but you know i think that's part of communication too is that they have to be out enough to where we can do the communication stuff that you're talking about and they have to show up at meetings. And we've had some problems with the more shy people. Uh, I remember Garrison Keefer used, used to use the word shy persons. <laughs> anyway, any thoughts about that? You know, very different. It's a very different way of, um, almost most of the communication is in body language and then maybe a few words they say, but it's so different from what I normally would do, so. Yeah. Um, so again, a really common thread that I see, and thank you for naming it. Um, I, I don't think your community is unusual. I think having more introverts than extroverts is pretty typical in co-housing. Um, and I think it's one of the reasons that we struggle sometimes with meetings and decision making and kind of meeting the goals that we have is that we come from this competitive culture that rewards extroverts, right? If you're in a corporate environment, odds are that speaking and carrying the floor and uh, having a charisma and an authority about you and being willing to speak up first, all of these things that are more extroverted traits, um, I, I would use another word, which is uh, the word, another word I would use is maximizers, people who, you know, sort of the more stressed they get, the more energy they put out there. So if they get frustrated, they get louder, they get, um, bigger in all kinds of ways um and, and this sort of describes your typical executive in a corp corporation it also describes the behavior that probably got rewarded by your third grade teacher um and it describes about half of the population tends to go that way and the other half who i'm going to contend are just as valuable and just as appropriate in their behavior go the other way they tend to be quieter 
And the more stressed they get, the more quiet they get, the more they pull in. That turtle head back into the shell is great metaphor. Um, and what I believe about what happens in relationships between these two groups, which inevitably you have in co-housing, and it's almost always the introverts or the turtles who are the dominant group in co-housing, or that the more numerous group in co-housing, um, is that the turtles feel overwhelmed. They feel like there's all sorts of aggression coming at them. They feel unsafe in meetings, so they don't go, because <laughs> why would they want to do that? Um, because they feel hurt, right? All of that energy that the maximizers are throwing out is sometimes physically painful, but certainly emotionally painful to the minimizers or the turtles. And, and nobody means it to be, right? This isn't an intentional wounding kind of situation, but it's really hard for the turtles. So the turtles go into their shells, they pull back, um, maybe because of something the maximizers did or maybe not, um, maybe because there's something else, but their, their instinct is for safety is to pull away, which is hurtful to the maximizers because they're trying to connect in the way that they know how to connect, which is to go to a meeting and talk and share an idea and maybe get bigger and louder. And if you won't listen to me, then if I get even bigger and even louder, then maybe you will, right? So that person that we identify as aggressive in community is almost always someone trying desperately to be heard. So you get this dynamic where they play against each other. Um, and I, what I recommend, a few things. I, I do workshops about this as well. This is something I cover often in workshops. And I do that in large part to normalize it, to say this happens. And turtle behavior is normal and healthy. And on the other side, we call the maximizer sometimes hailstorms because it can feel like a hailstorm <laughs> to the people on the other side of it. And, and the point there is that it's not, um, nobody's trying to eat you alive, right? They're just doing what they do. They're dropping hail and that can be hurtful. And when her turtles withdraw, that can be hurtful. And so we've got these normal behaviors that are not intended to hurt each other, but in fact they do. And so if we can start to normalize that and begin to have a dialogue about what those impacts are and what is it that the, the more turtly people need in a meeting? What is it that they need from hailstorms? And get really open to that. And then the, the hailstorms can, can say what they need. And, and I, I can tell you what that conversation usually looks like. Usually the turtles say they need space, they need quiet, they need breaks, they need quiet space in that they could speak into. Um, they need the hailstorms to be quieter. <laughs> um, what the hailstorms tend to say they need is to be told. Um, they, and they need the turtles to understand that they're not trying to be overpowering. They're not trying to take more than their share of the influence or, or get their way. They want desperately to hear from the turtles. And and they don't know how to do that. And when they get louder and bigger, they don't notice that they're doing it. It's so natural to them. And so what they ask more than anything else is tell us. And what happens is when we introduce that language of hailstorms and turtles, that which is totally different than say apathetic and aggressive, which is what we tend to say about each other. When we can call it hailstorms and turtles with a shared understanding that this is just normal life. These are things humans do and there's nothing wrong with either one of them. They're just not working together very well right now. That then the turtles can start to say, I'm feeling hailstormed. And the hailstorms don't have to experience that as an attack. They can just experience it as information and shift because they know something about what to do with that. And then on the other side, the hailstorms can say, okay, well, I'm feeling surrounded by turtles here. Will somebody talk to me? What's going on? And, and when they name that need, instead of just getting louder and louder and louder, hopefully one of the turtles can peek out of their shell enough to say, it's just too loud. Can we have a five minute break? Or whatever that need is. And by, by giving it some non-judgmental language, and having it be something that is a shared understanding and community, it actually really is very possible for turtles and hailstorms to coexist and to work well together and to be equally influential in community. And I'm gonna tell you that that's the kind of personal growth that I'm advocating. That's the kind of growing that when we engage, that when we live in community, we learn how to do and, and we take that out into the world. And, and maybe we could end up with, I don't know, some legislators that don't feel like they need to yell at each other. 
<laughs> because they have another way to communicate and connect. I don't know. I just think the world needs it. And I think it's exactly because co-housing brings together people with those kinds of differences. Um, and we live too closely together to ignore them. We're going to trip over them. And that space in which we trip over those differences can be, and usually is, powerful growth space. And I think we need it. Does that help? Yeah, and what I'm hearing as an overall theme is how to build safety and also build modeling of maybe learning how to convert so you slow down, the volume is lower, you literally see the way that a more shy person would talk and you kind of go into their world and be curious about, oh, I wonder, you know, sometimes the subtle good ideas will come from the more quiet person. And sometimes having silence in a meeting is actually golden because, you know, it slows everybody down. We take a pause. We make sure everybody's emotionally with us. And then, whew, the, the quieter people then will speak up. And, and we make a regular habit of saying, and someone that hasn't shared already. So that's, that's another but building safety and kind of going to the turtle way of being and saying, you know, that's a very valid, there's a lot of depth sometimes from quieter people. So what a blessing, you know? And I think the beauty is that the hailstorms need the quiet too. They, they, they don't ask for it. They don't even, they're not even necessarily conscious that they need it, but it settles them too. It gives them a different, so and this is this is the thing is that when we bump up against what somebody else needs in meeting that need we pretty reliably shift something in us that also needed shifting we heal something in ourselves that was getting in our way um so yeah thanks for the question love your thoughts others karen is somebody who's um in the very early stages of starting community um, and someone who's had some experience in living community, one of the things that I'm finding is some of the folks who are are joining, and it's, it's things that I need to be working on as well, is making that transition that you talked about earlier um, to that collaborative culture and learning how to do that from the dominant culture that all of us live in on a daily basis and that many of us um, really crave, and that's why we're, you know, why we're doing this thing in the first place. Um, any, any additional suggestions on how it, kind of the outset to help prepare us to realize, yeah, this is going to be different. This is, this is a, a we're, we're going to need to change our mindsets and to, to rewrite some of our, our, our understandings of, of, of how we do things. Um, any, any suggestions or, or counsel on that? Yeah, uh, naming it, as you just did, I think is a great first beginning. Um, and I think most co-housing professionals, including those who don't work in the process side, will tell you that communities reliably, like consistently across the board, communities spend less on support for the relationship, organizational structure side um, than would be recommended. Um, so. I, I think we're trying to learn a new thing and we need teachers. And that's a very self-serving piece of advice to give you. Um, and I think it's true. And the other thing that I'll say, having attempted this myself, is that hoping that someone within your community is gonna be your primary teacher for relationship and conflict and consensus or sociocracy work. Um, it doesn't matter how smart they are, how good or experienced they are. It's really tough to be in that role in your own community. Um, so certainly you'll have folks that help with it and that draw attention to it and that do work in that realm. And I'm, I'm going to recommend getting help in early. Um, there are some practices that I recommend, the mirroring piece, which that web chat number two is about. I like that in every meeting. I think just deciding ahead early, early on that when we get together, we're going to take time to practice, to you know, train the part of our brain that actually listens. It doesn't get a whole lot of exercise in mainstream culture, I can tell you that. And neurology is pretty clear, use it or lose it. Well, we um, have largely lost it. So if we want it back, we're gonna have to practice it. 
it also has the the handy effect of helping us get to know each other when we're new in community. So I think it's really powerful for that. And it, I think, is very grounding. It creates safety. There, there is something about sitting across from someone and having them deeply hear you in that way that makes you feel safe in the whole group, in the whole room. The, the trust increases, the, the sense of safety in the room increases, the willingness to speak increases, the ability to hear, I think, increases because we're practicing the part of our brain that really listens. Um, so, you know, half an hour to do community building out of every meeting sounds like it's really expensive when you've got 3,000 tasks to do to try to get, you know, an architect hired and a piece of land purchased and all those things that you're doing in those early stages. I think it's a bargain. 30 minutes to get all of that safety and be getting to know your neighbors and all of that, I think is, is very worthwhile. So just really working those kinds of processes into your meetings. And, and I will caution some communities hear that and they think, okay, well, we'll do some fun, goofy, get to know you icebreaker thing. And, and I'm going to tell you, it's not the same. I'm not opposed to icebreakers. I think they can be fun, but it won't do what I'm describing. Um, or generally won't. I, I, you know, I, I think there might be other ways to do it. This is the one that I have found easiest and most reliable. Um, and then there are some other versions of it that I, I do work with communities on bridging circles sometimes, which is a kind of a group version of the mirroring thing. It takes longer, but it's a way to engage more and more deeply with like something that would already be on your agenda. So you could have a conversation about sustainability and you can big, bring in those things into the mirroring exercise as well so that it's not necessarily entirely separate from what you're talking about in the meeting. It may be a beginning of processing of the thing that you're then going to talk about too. So um, I think that's super helpful. I don't know if any of that helps from where you are. It's, it's where we are working with somebody who's bringing in to, to work on this and we have been pretty okay. intentional um, in, in doing process and, and, and formative kinds of things at, at each of our, our group meetings as well but that's, it's helpful to be reminded of that continually. Yeah. So. Great. Thanks. Let me just to add that, you know, that our brain is designed for survival mainly. And, you know, so we want to get our way. We want to have power over. That's the, the way that I look. Nonviolent communication is what I've been practicing for 10 years. And so having trust and having examples of people who are truly collaborative is so important and then you see how it works and that it's better for all of us what's better for all of us <laughs> you know we've had some early examples in our co housing community it was just wonderful it was more than just facilitation it was like examples in the meeting of people having differences duking it out and then the good feeling at the end it's almost like get motivated by the joy and, and then you have more trust that this works you know there's a part of me that's like, ah, yeah, it's not gonna work, ah, uh, you know, <laughs> the naysayer. And, and, then, and then the opposite all of a sudden turns out and, and, and really um, that's where we need to sort of, I think, get our brain. There's a guy named Rick Hansen from Northern California who talks about building resiliency in our brain and also in our relationships, uh, building that positive expectation that things are really gonna be better. Um, because that's not something our brain does naturally. Our brain wants to keep us from getting, uh, you know, bit by a snake. <laughs> yep. Yep. I think that that's right. And, and, and that's another piece of where I think some study is interesting is sort of looking at what are our neurological tendencies and the more we can go, oh, that's how that works. Okay, I see what's going on now. I don't have to listen to that, you know, fire alarm that's going off because it, it's trying to tell me that it's a snake and really what I'm looking at is a garden hose. I'm okay here, <laughs> um, but yeah, doing some work in those realms, I think is really useful. I will say, I think the power over thing is not in our genetics. I think it's in our culture. I, I, I think that the, the, the sort of alert and reactivity and a lot of those things are pretty innate in humanity because we're trying to survive, but the, the power over, it's not in all indigenous cultures. It's not in all humans. It's very unique to current modern America and capitalist cultures and Western cultures. So I don't know if it matters where it comes from, um, but I, I absolutely believe that we can, we can live another way, we can teach ourselves another way, and we can teach our children another way. And I think our survival and the survival of the planet depends on it.
others. Hi, can I um, pipe sure. up here? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Welcome. Okay, great. I um, only heard part of what you were saying, Karen, about um, describing the characteristics of um, relationship and co-housing. And it really reminds me a lot of um, partnership, inter-relationships, I mean, intimate relationships, marriages. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to throw that in so people, um, you know, tend to maybe not delve into them with as much commitment. <laughs> I don't know. Well, what they, they probably intend to, and then when there's conflict, then they don't know what to do or that kind of thing. But it sounded like a lot of what you were saying really mirrored a one on one relationship. I think that's very true and quite perceptive of you. Um, a lot of my perspective and my training comes from Imago relationships and the huge majority of the Imago relationships work is couples work. Um, they've been doing it for 30 years and it's been a more recent revelation that an awful lot of what's true in couples turns out to be true of other relationships. And I think it's particularly true in co-housing, which might come closer to a marriage than any other relationship that we have that isn't romantic in nature uh, because we do share a bunch of stuff. And we do, we make right. a pretty big commitment when we buy a house together. So, right. you know, if I'm in a club with you and I don't like you, I can just leave, right? Or I can do my hailstorm bit and power over and then if you're a turtle, you'll leave, which is very convenient for me, maybe. Mm. Except actually it's not because I'm sad when you leave. Um, but in most spaces, we can just do that. Jobs a little less, but even then, the tendency is for when things get conflicted, it's pretty easy to just opt out. But when you've bought a house and you've made friends with some of the people and you've invested in this dream and you've put in that time together, it's a lot harder. It's not impossible. You know, we, we don't hold anybody in, in co-housing. But in fact, we have so much invested that it's hard to leave. And because it's hard to leave, we stick around and do the work. And, and this is why and I think you're right that it is similar so, someone said to me once that living in co-housing is like being married to 30 people <laughs> and, and, and I think that's somewhat true in the really good ways because you have 30 people you can call when you're in trouble and they'll really yeah. reliably come help you even right. if they're mad at you that day and it's true in the tough ways you're you're in this with 30 people and sometimes you don't get along with some of them or sometimes you disagree right. or sometimes whatever um and and I think that's a lot of the power of it is some of it's the shared intention and some of it's that we all want to and all that kind of thing I, I think is also true and at the end of the day one of the really unique things I think about co-housing and this that it's hard to walk away and so we we are, are willing to invest more to solve the problems because we can't simply walk out the door and that is um one big reason why I decided to go and t learn about coaching because I was concerned about conflict resolution and I had already wanted to live in a community of some kind. And um, the more I studied coaching, um, you know, I already was a psychology major, so I, I knew mm -hmm. about that. Mm -hmm. But as, as the more I studied uh, techniques, some of the things you mentioned, uh, mirroring and you know, there's a whole ton of other stuff like in, in neuro-linguistic programming that I study. Um, so those things are really helpful. And I'm glad to hear you're doing, you do do workshops on that. And I would love to see more. And um, when I get more into my co-housing project, I would love to also develop programs too, like, like you're doing. And, you know, maybe learn from what you're already trailblazing in that area. I don't know if I'm trailblazing. I'm certainly following along with a lot of people who've done this before me, but yeah, it, it, it is a movement and it's a space where we all learn. And 
I, I think the people who've been doing it the longest are the ones who know the most about how much they still have to grow into. <laughs> I hope that's true because that's the trend I'm on. The more I learn, the more I'm like, boy, do I have a lot left to go. Um, <laughs> because, because that's just the nature. We humans are designed to grow. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And community right. is just such a fabulous tool to help us do it. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck with your project. I'm excited to see you coming along. It's, it's not moving that fast, but, um, you know, housing prices in Hawaii are just insane. We're yeah. like, there's so many projects, so many houses, single houses that are double digit millions now. It's just, mm. it's out of this, you know, it's incredible. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. anyway, I'm still not giving up my dream, so. More power to you. Thank you. You know, I'll just say that in our co-housing community, we um, to slowly over time, it wasn't built all at once. The same builder made many of our, our homes. And so there were all these logistical decisions and there was just a lot of goal orientation that we went into with a huge agenda. And it's hard to intersperse in that agenda. No, we need to slow it down. And instead of getting things done, the goal orientation maybe needs to be building trust among each other and listening to each other and uh, you know it's like it's underneath um, I don't know any thoughts about that it's like at the beginning you're just trying to get stuff done and you need to decide how are we, how are we going to have a pet policy <laughs> so the meeting goes on for five hours talking about pets <laughs> and, you know and, and so there's all this getting it done and then now we have you know, all the houses built. So there's even more kind of, mm, what's the work now? Mm. Yeah, I think there's multiple truths there. Um, I mean, one dynamic that I see happen a lot is that, um, you know, early on you're looking for land and it's just kind of slow because you're looking, you're looking and looking and that, you know, hopefully just doesn't take years, but often does. So you've got this window of time that's actually, I think the ideal time to do that trust building work that you were talking about, Carl. Um, and at that moment, people haven't invested a lot of money yet because you have, it's when you buy land that you tend to invest a lot of money. And so the amount that it costs to bring in somebody to do a workshop or do that kind of thing feels like a lot of money at that point in the process. Those who are, you know, into the land and have a project under construction, um, don't consider that lots of money at all, but it feels like it at the beginning. And so there's this pattern that happens that, um, the it, it, as about the time that we get to where we feel like we have the money and the budget to actually bring in somebody we're suddenly caught in that flurry of design and all the decisions that you're talking about and it's suddenly much harder to invest the the time part to get it done um which is why again i'll i'll say it if you can figure out how to put together the money before you even have land, like the earlier you do it, that increase in trust and getting systems going, working well, um, is going to carry you through so that your pet policy doesn't take a five hour conversation <laughs> um, or whatever. I mean, it might take five hours, but it won't take 20 or something like that. Um, so I think it pays huge dividends later. And I understand why it feels like a lot of money when you know, you're not, you don't have a big budget yet. Um, and so there's this balancing act. So I think it, it's almost always true that the, the time and energy and money that you invest in relationship building will make everything else easier. And I think it's true that there are moments in the whole development process where you simply have to sacrifice that because you've got to do the work to keep the development going and you don't have the capacity to do both. Um, so my hope for communities is that before they get to that point, they've done enough of the relationship work that they can get through the development work without doing too much harm to each other and relationships there. And I think that's usually the case. Um, but this is, you know, I, I encourage people to have what I would call a process consultant or a relationship consultant. I also generally encourage a development consultant. If you're trying to build buildings, hire somebody who knows how to do that. Um, and I tell them that very often what the 
you know, so I, I will have clients who are saying, well, our development consultant is telling us to do this and I'm telling them to do something maybe different. And I'm saying, it's our job to give you different advice, right? It's my job to tell you what's going to help your relationships the most. It's your development consultant's job to tell you what's going to get your buildings built on time and on budget. And sometimes those things come into conflict with each other and you have to pick. And, and that's just, that's just it. Um, so, um, that's the, the dilemma that it's in. And, and I want to name that there absolutely are times, particularly for forming communities that I think you probably can't do the relationship work. Um, probably less of them than people think there are, but you're not going to get good relationship work in when most people are incredibly stressed about development deadlines and have already put in three times as much time to co-housing as they ever expected to. And, you know, you, you just get in that bind which is why I hope that people will invest it early when things are slow, <laughs> even if it doesn't feel slow, <laughs> it, it speeds up. So that's all sort of that development process game. But I think you're right that it's tricky. Um, I'm seeing a note from Oak Creek Commons. Karen, can I say something really quick? Yeah, of course. And that is that um, I also want to just point out, this might be obvious to everybody, but um, it's, all of the personal growth will continue forever, right? It's not just <laughs> at the beginning of, uh, yes. <laughs> of the forming community. And there are times that you need refreshers or you need to uh, maybe come at it a different way or what you have been doing is not as functional. And some of that is um, uh, things change, people change, relationships change, and there's new people and there's turnover. And my community who has been in existence for 15 years plus, meaning 15 years living here and then the years before that, we still have to work on it. You didn't just check off your personal growth box and get to the done? <laughs> I wish. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Um, I'm seeing it up from Oak Creek Comments. What would you introduce if our community names in involvement are need? I'm not there's a capital E involvement and I'm not sure that's not a term I'm familiar with. So I don't know if that's a typo or something else. Well, no. it, it's involvement. Sorry, Karen. Uh -huh. Sure. So the meaning that people don't in, show up to meetings enough, they didn't work enough, that kind of thing. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah, you got to get curious about yeah. why not. Okay. Did I get you, Jean? I, you're kind of, your sound is not great. Okay. This is something we've named uh -huh. uh, as an umbrella to yeah. many different aspects. Rental, uh, you know, working together in, on teams. So involvement is the bigger umbrella. And I'm just wondering, how would you approach this with such a large umbrella? Yeah. Uh, we can break it down into, you know, not understanding consensus. We can break it down even further into, you know, a number of renters. But yeah. where would we start? Yeah, um, we're right at the end of our hour, so I'm going to be really quick. Um, and it's a big topic, but a common one. Um, so I'd be curious about all the things that you've already identified as contributing to that big umbrella. And I'd be curious about trust, and I'd be curious about power dynamics. Um, so, it is, you know, and what's the sense of connection? And because when the way I want involvement to happen in a community, certainly one that I'm part of, is I want the involvement to be fueled by connection with each other, by investment in the community, by you know that care and compassion and, and that sort of thing, as opposed to guilt or responsibility or whatever. And so I'm getting curious about why there isn't enough of that stuff to make it, or, or what's getting in the way. Maybe there's a ton of that stuff, but something else is still getting in the way, but that's the kind of thread I'd be looking at first and then see where it leads. 
Thank you, Karen. I know it's a quick question, uh, a big question, and we're, we're hoping to ponder it with you. That would be lovely. I would love to come and ponder. <laughs> okay. Um, I would like to be respectful of everyone's time and say, Karen, thank you very, very much. And thank all of you for being here tonight. Um, this web chat will be, the recording will be available through the Coho US, the cohousing.org um, website. And uh, as well as pretty much anywhere on the website, there's a way to contact Karen or I if you have other random questions or comments, please do. Um, it is fundraising time for nonprofits, of which we are a non charitable organization, a nonprofit. We are 17 people short of reaching our evergreen neighbor campaign goal. So um, please consider being an evergreen neighbor and donating. I put that link in the chat as well. As far as upcoming events, uh, super excited to say as a part of our Simple Series 2020, uh, we will be offering an affordable conference on affordable co-housing, and that is online. It is an affordable online conference about affordable co-housing. So those details can be found on our website. Uh, it is going to be February 22nd, which is a Saturday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Mountain Time, so make your adjustments. And uh, registrations will be open sometime after the first of the year. So thank you all for being here tonight. Take care, everybody. Night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, thank you.